Kelsey. This is my channel, The Fancy Hat Lady Reads. I am wearing one of my fancy booktube hats, and today I'm bringing you a double book review of two standalone fantasy novels that were both released this year in 2018, and that I thought paired together interestingly for this double review because they are both new books taking on classic themes. So the first of these is The Oddling Prince by Nancy Springer. This was released in May of this year from Tachyon Publications, and I had a NetGalley arc of this book. And the second is going to be The Queens of Innis Lear by Tessa Grattan, which was a March release from Tor Books. I had what I thought was a whole arc, but turned out just to be a sample of this from NetGalley. And then after I finished the sample, I moved on and finished the book with a hard copy from the library. So I'm going to start off with The Oddling Prince, which is the much shorter book of the two and is going to be the much shorter review. Nancy Springer is an author who's written a wide range of books over a long career, but this is actually the first book of hers that I've read. Now I want to start off this review by saying that I have come to realize that I hold new releases to a slightly different set of standards than I do older books that I read. Not necessarily harsher standards, but different. While I can rate a vintage book on how well it holds up, or even a backlist book on sheer enjoyment. I'm always asking in some corner of my mind what a new book is bringing to the table that we haven't seen before, or how an author is trying to do an old thing in a new way. But I would say that The Oddling Prince is pastiche through and through, without any notably fresh spins on its themes for me to trumpet for you in a review. The story, which centers around two teenage princes in a medieval Scottish kingdom, the mortal Eric and the otherworldly Alberic, leans heavily on themes that can be traced back to, say, The King of Elfland's Daughter, which was published in 1924, and that have been rattling around certain strains of the fantasy genre ever since. At the beginning of the book, Alberic arrives, as if out of thin air, saves the king's life from a mysterious curse inflicted by a magical ring, and in doing so relinquishes his immortality for a life in the mortal world, where he must experience the passage of time, witness death, and learn the ways of humankind, cruelties and kindnesses alike. This magical savior reveals himself to be the king's second son, fathered in the magical other world that mortals call Elfland. But the king has lost his memories of being abducted by the queen of Elfland and kept her prisoner, and instead of welcoming Alberic as his lost son, he views him with suspicion and distrust. It's the king's mortal son and heir, our point of view character, Eric, who instantaneously develops a deep and unbreakable bond with his half-brother. Eric's inability to reconcile his darkly changed father and his beloved newfound brother forms the central conflict of this story, as it tears the royal household apart. The story of the two brothers actually reminded me pretty strongly of some elements of The Changeling Sea by Patricia A. McKillop, which was published in 1988, which I had just recently read when I picked up this book. But Springer's writing is less whimsical than McKillop's, and she deals more directly with some heavier subject matter, such as the realities of violence and war. I would also include a content warning in this for some suicidal thoughts. Eric's eventual polite romance with his really very young love interest, Marissa, comes across surprisingly well considering the potentially cringe-worthy historical practices for arranged marriages that are at play in the plot. But it's still far from making any list of great fantasy love stories anyone out there might be compiling. And the magical resolution of the story has satisfying mythic resonance and is probably the closest that the book gets to a truly inspired flight of fancy, but I don't think it's going to blow many minds either. I liked The Oddling Prince. I really did. The type of classic fantasy that it recreates is comfort food to me. And it's something that I would like to see reintroduced into the mainstream of the genre. But there's nothing groundbreaking or innovative here, 
to make the argument for its continued relevance. If you had told me that this was published in the 70s or the 80s, I probably would have believed you. I might have even given it a higher rating. So this was a solid middle-of-the-road three-star read for me of a type of folklorish fantasy that I just really enjoy, but I don't think that this book itself is going to stand out in my memory. So now I'm going to move on to my second book review for The Queens of Innes Lear, which is a book that I have in fact been thinking about a lot in the time since I finished it. Now I would say that one of the markers of a successful retelling for me is that there are moments where I forget that I know the outline of the story already, and I'm surprised by something that I did in fact know was coming. And although Tessa Grattan's epic fantasy King Lear retelling does diverge from Shakespeare's plot in a number of key ways, especially as it draws closer to the end, it is faithful enough that there were plenty of those moments for me. When I took a pause, shook my head clear, and said, oh yes, of course, this is King Lear. It's a premise that in retrospect seems so obvious that I'm kind of surprised it hadn't been done already. Epic fantasy King Lear makes a lot of sense the moment you think about it. Lear has all of those hallmarks that have caused some modern fantasy epics to be branded as Shakespearean. Royal family drama played out on the political stage, underhanded betrayals, and you know, like, a lot of people who die. And while the setting of the play is England, the source material is more legend and folk tale than history, and what the play is lacking in magical stakes Grattan seamlessly supplies. I had actually worried from the tone of some of the pre-release hype that this book would end up being too grimdark and bloody for my taste. So I was pleased to find that its tone is actually much more slow and moody than brutal and violent, and that the tragic events evoke far more pathos than shock. I'll admit that Lear has never been a favorite of mine. From context, I actually gather that it isn't one of Grattan's either. There are a number of things about the play that are just straight up frustrating from a modern feminist perspective. Like how the play's ingenue heroine Cordelia, who actually instigates the entire story, gets shipped off to France by the end of the first scene to marry a minor character, and doesn't show up again until the end when she arrives just in time to die. What Grattan's version does is recenter the story away from Lear himself, making the king's tragic decline more a given circumstance for the drama that unfolds than the main event. As the title suggests, Lear's three daughters, here named Gala, Regan, and Elia, are all major protagonists, and Elia herself becomes the heart and soul of the story. But they are far from being the only point of view characters in this ensemble epic. Though the book starts at approximately the same point in the story that Shakespeare's play does, much of the story is revealed through flashbacks, and the many characters whose stories and histories rise to the surface give the Queens of Innes Lear a truly sprawling feel. Innes Lear is a small, rugged island nation whose kings traditionally take the same name. But while the current King Lear, now declining into senile incompetence, may have once been a more competent ruler than he is now, it's clear that he was never really a great one. His fatal error is his trust in star prophecies above all else to the point of denying and forbidding the island's natural earth magic, closing off the wells of sacred root water. The stars correctly predicted not only the arrival of his beloved foreign queen, but also her death. And it becomes clear that the loss of the queen, who doesn't factor into Shakespeare's play at all, is the tragedy that has fractured this royal family beyond mending. To Lear, it was an affirmation of the star's power and the source of his increased zealotry. Elia was a young enough child when her mother died that the event brought her closer to her father in mourning. Though she had a natural affinity for earth magic and the language of trees, she forsook it to become the star priestess that her father wanted her to be. But Gala and Regan both suspect 
that Lear had their mother killed in order to prove his star prophecies true, and they can never forgive him. It's worth noting here that in this version of the story, Queen Dalat was a black woman, and so all three princesses are women of color, and their relationships with their mother's heritage is an interesting through line. Gala, the eldest, expects to succeed her father to the throne. She believes in political and military power, not stars or earth magic. But she's made concessions to Lear's star-foretold expectations of her so that he will name her his heir, marrying an ambitious man she doesn't love with no plans to ever let him have the real power that he anticipates as her husband. Gala plans to never bear children and to rule Innes Lear as a warrior king in her own right, with her sister Regan as her partner in power instead. Regan practices earth magic and married for love, but despite her increasingly desperate efforts, has been unable to produce the heirs that her and Gala's plan relies on, instead suffering a series of miscarriages. So when Lear announces that he will divest himself from power in a manner that the stars have ordained for him, and then his youngest and favorite daughter fails to respond in the way that he expects, matters in Innes Lear are perfectly primed for catastrophe. But it's not quite accurate to say that the Queens of Innes Lear is just a retelling centered around the female characters, because Grattan makes Shakespeare's appealing but frustratingly underdeveloped villain Edmund, another emotional pillar of her story, though here his name is Ban. In the original play, Edmund is the bastard son of the Earl of Gloucester, whose scheming against his over-trusting father to supplant his brother is a secondary plotline echo to what's happening in the primary plotline with Lear and his two older unkind daughters. Like the other characters in the book, Ban is given a much more extensive backstory, and is presented as an extremely likable character nursing a lot of past hurts, who becomes a compelling anti-hero as his vendetta against Lear and his father brings him down an increasingly dark path of betrayal. He and Elia were childhood sweethearts, but they haven't seen each other since Ban was sent away to the mainland nation of Aramoria years ago. Talented in earth magic, he has become a full-fledged wizard, and has earned the trust of Morimaros, the king of Aramoria, who is Shakespeare's king of France. A covert mission for Mars brings him back to Innes Lear, and yes, it is King Lear, so you can guess some of what ensues. Turning Elia and Ban into star-crossed lovers of a sort adds an interesting layer of emotional entanglement to the story, and the two characters are sort of poised as narrative counterparts to one another, opposing forces around whom the fate of Innes Lear revolves. While Ban becomes entangled in Learish intrigue, Elia departs for Aramoria with Mars, whom she is expected to marry. Elia's journey is one of discovering that she can no longer be a passive character in her family's saga, and of the discovery of what she needs to become if Innes Lear is to survive its ordeal. Mars is also a very interesting character, balancing royal responsibility with his own personal feelings, as his increasing respect for Elia comes into conflict with his political schemes for her country. Grattan also fabricates a couple of other major characters who I think really enrich the story. One of the major downfalls of sidelining Lear in this story is that we don't get to see a ton of his fool. Grattan gives Lear's fool a daughter, Aoife, who is Elia's attendant and confidant, and serves some of the same functions for Elia that her father does for the king. We also learn a lot about Ban's mother, Brona, who is a witch and a guardian of sorts to Innes Lear's beleaguered magic, commanding a lot of respect in her own right. The magic of this world and the essential magical nature of Innes Lear are presented as beautiful and mysterious, 
which is just how I like the magic in my fantasy. It's the sort of magic where trees speak in their own secret language and the land cares who rules it. I also enjoyed some of the more heightened language of the book, though it is inconsistent throughout. Though there are chapters where beautiful language is used for epic fantasy storytelling effect, it does kind of come and go. There are also scenes where the dialogue seems artificially heightened in order to accommodate lines of Shakespeare's text, while elsewhere in the book the same characters will speak with a much more modern colloquial style. As far as the story goes, I'm not certain that Grattan does as thorough a job with her reclamation of the two older sisters as she does with the youngest, though that's a pretty heroic thing to ask, all things considered. Gala and Reagan are both complex, flawed characters whose motivations and actions you will completely understand, but they just don't get to carry quite as much emotional weight in the story as Elia does. Also, there are some minor elements of the ending that I might have preferred had gone a little differently, but for me, these are quibbles. I found this retelling to be utterly engrossing and captivating enough that I am tempted to claim it as my new headcanon version of King Lear. So I gave this book 4 out of 5 stars. I think it's really worth reading, especially if you're interested in Shakespeare retellings. Before I go, I would like to mention that several times during the writing of this review I was tempted to go on a tangent of comparisons to Nahum Tate's totally nuts restoration era rewrite of King Lear, which I studied in college. None of you would have cared, so I didn't. But I would like a cookie for my restraint now. Also, if you are interested, you can look it up for yourself. Okay, that is all I have for now. Let me know if you've read either of these books, or if you're planning to, let me know what you think. Anyhow, I hope you're having a nice day. That is all. Bye for now.